Welcome to part three. This is just a little review here so that you get a clear picture of what we're going to be doing with the Punnett squares. We use the gametes in the Punnett squares because we want to see what sperm meets what egg. This is to review how the sperm and egg are made. Looking at one trait and one allele so that you can see how they split apart. So the one on the left is a homozygous parent for uppercase A, uppercase A. Could be the purple flower color because it's dominant. Uh, if we use that, um, maybe that'll help. And the zygotes are, are the gametes that these split into. You only have half the chromosome set in a sperm or egg. In other words, only one chromosome of the two homologous pairs are in the gametes. This is a homologous pair because they're the same chromosome and it's also homozygous because it has the same allele on the chromosome. So the gametes that are possible here are a sperm or egg that has uppercase A or uppercase A. That is all this parent can contribute to its potential offspring. So all gametes are identical regarding this gene. Now we're going to look at a heterozygous parent. That means that it's got an uppercase and a lowercase for the same allele on the same chromosome so they're a homologous pair. But it has to split apart to form the gamete. These are the two possible gametes. Again, remember, only one of each chromosome can go into the gametes. So one gamete has the uppercase A and one gamete has the lowercase a. Now it depends on, in humans, only one sperm can get in to one egg. So only one of those is going to interact with another gamete from the other parent. So this allele produces, or this heterozygous parent produces two gametes. It has half our uppercase A and half our lowercase A. Now the Punnett square, some of you may have had it in high school, and this is what we're going to be using. I only present a little bit on this PowerPoint. My presentation online has many animations and videos as well as practice problems. If you're in my class, we will be doing practice problems. So when we do a Punnett square, you're looking at one parent and another parent, so a sperm and egg, and we're looking at the gametes. And we only look at the genes of interest. We're not looking at all the genes the person has. So in this case, we're going to start off with one gene from each parent. And that makes it a, um, a monohybrid cross. So here it says list the sperm on the top, the egg on the side. Sometimes it doesn't matter unless you want to know who produced what gene. 
the resulting squares that come from the punnet are the zygote or the offspring. Now we're going to look at doing a punnet square. This slide is a, <coughs> a little interactive. Just to review, uh, the dominant trait is the uppercase letter, recessive trait, lowercase letter. Homozygous dominant is the uppercase A, uppercase A. Homozygous recessive, lowercase, lowercase. Heterozygous, uppercase, lowercase. So what we're going to be looking at is a cross between two heterozygous species. Doesn't matter what it is. So if you read a problem that says there's a cross between a heterozygous versus a heterozygous, you know that there's an upper and a lowercase letter that represents heterozygous. So it's really important that you read the problem. And if you know the terms, you will be able to develop the Punnett square. So here's the Punnett square, and we are crossing, which means mating, uh, two heterozygous and uppercase A, lowercase A is the genotype, and the phenotype is determined by the dominant trait. It doesn't matter what it is. We're not talking any anything here. We're just saying a dominant and a recessive. So we are now going to determine what happens when you cross the two heterozygous, the sperm and the egg. So first you have to put the parents' genes that could be in the sperm and egg at the top and the side. That goes back to the previous slides that I showed you how during meiosis when the sperm and egg are made they only get one copy of the trait. The other copy will go into another sperm or egg. It's not that it's disappeared, it's just that a sperm and egg are only half the chromosomes. They can't have more than 23 of the chromosomes in humans at any rate. So now we're going to see the four possible outcomes and that's all there would be. This is a monohybrid cross, which means we've got two hybrid uh, mating and it's one trait. That's all we're looking at. Whatever the A is, doesn't matter. I'm just telling you it's a heterozygous. So now we're going to figure out what could the children be. So we've got an uppercase A there that could come either from the top or the side and another uppercase A. One from the top, one from the side, that's a homozygous dominant. Purebred, true breeding. Now here we have the lowercase a that came from the left side and the uppercase a that came from the top. This is a heterozygous offspring. So now here the third possibility is again heterozygous. Uppercase A from the left, lowercase a from the top. We have one left. One lowercase a. Looks like it could be the top or the bottom. Guess what the last one's going to be? A lowercase a. So now we have a homozygous recessive. So now we here have three possible outcomes or genotypes. Homozygous dominant, one of them. Two heterozygous and one homozygous recessive. So the genotype ratio is one to two to one, which means that there's a 25% chance homozygous dominant will be the offspring. 
25% chance for homozygous recessive and 50% chance for heterozygous. Then the phenotype ratio is determined by the dominant gene because the dominant gene expresses itself. So no matter what this A represents, you've got three versus one. So three of them were going to express the uppercase A, the dominant gene, whereas there will be one out of four that have the homozygous recessive trait. Not as common, and that's normal as you'll see in the population. Okay, now this cross is a dihybrid, which means we are looking at two traits instead of just one. When we did the monohybrid, we looked at one trait, like purple flower versus white flower. That was all the same trait, just different genes caused it. Now we're looking at purple and white, plus we are looking at height. So in this case, we have to have four genes from each side to determine what the possible outs offsprings will be. You have to figure out what are going to be the gametes. In this case with the purebred on the left, uppercase A is the purple, B is the height. So the only gametes that plant could produce, and we have to have two because we're looking at two traits is A for the purple, B for the height. The one on the right is your recessive traits. It's homozygous recessive for two traits. White flowers, short stems. And the only gametes that could be produced by that plant is a lowercase a and a lowercase b. When you put that together and do the Punnett square, you will have all heterozygotes. So you're going to have plants and it's on the left side that if you follow the arrow you'll see that all of the F1 offspring were uppercase A, lowercase a, uppercase B, lowercase b. So now we are going to do here the F1 generation and if you remember it goes back to the same as we did with the one trait we now are doing mating a plant that's heterozygous for height and color with itself so now you have to figure out the gametes and I do have a slide coming up and I also have an animation in the course that shows you exactly how I demonstrate in class to determine the gametes. This is something you need to know for the test. Uh, I do expect you to try to determine the gametes. There are four possible gametes. Head homozygous uh, dominant for the A and the B. So that's tall and purple. Um, the next one is uppercase A, lowercase b. Uh, next one, lowercase a, uppercase b. And then finally, lower and lower. Now, both are going to be the same on each side because you're mating the same generation. And now you do the exact same thing you did with the Punnett square. You're going to pull down all the top ones and pull across all the left ones. Now, it does make it easier for you to view if you put the uppercase letter first and then the lowercase and try to keep the A's together with the B's together. You don't have to because it's the same thing no matter what way you put it, but just for ease of viewing. It, it does make it better. And when you look at this, you're going to see the squares are colored for a reason. 
If you count the purple squares, we got four on the top, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All of those are purple tall. So that's why they're colored purple. Then we have three green. They're purple short. So you have a three possible purple short. Go to the yellowish and you'll see white tall. And you have three of them. And then finally you only have one that comes out like the original P generation white short. So what you're looking at, the ratio 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, that is the ratio or percentage that of the offsprings that will exhibit each of those traits. So here's another copy of the Punnett square and I see there's an error with the S that should be an uppercase A. This slide is more or less a, a, a just a better view and it's the exact same as the other except remember the S in the top two left ones that S is the uppercase A from the left side because it's black. Okay so all the black came from the left all the red came from the top. So this just sort of reviews the same thing. We're looking at a heterozygous cross of the F1 generation because Mendel studied two traits in this case instead of just one. So that means there has to be two different genes governing the trait, the A and the B. And each of them can have a dominant and a recessive characteristic. Both of them get passed down independently of the other. The A does not depend on the B. And that's very important. That's one of Mendel's laws of independent assortment. All of that is written about in the lecture I have online and I highly recommend that you go over that. Okay, so the phenotypes of the F2 offspring from the F1 hybrids that were the parents is pretty much in the ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So if he was to cross flowers and look at two traits, he would always find that most of them were dominant for both traits. But he would find that a third or three would have uppercase A dominant and a recessive B. He would also find three dominant for B and recessive for A and there would only be one recessive for both traits. So that is not common.